Yeah, more skull. Okay, so we've been looking at the bones of the skull, the sutures of the skull, the foramina of the skull and that sort of thing, right? Um, over the last few weeks. And apparently I've never talked about the fontanelles. And the fontanelles, these uh, membranous connections between these bones that we see in the fetus during birth, <coughs> during very early childhood. We should talk about the anatomy because that obviously, look, it relates to the sutures and the bones and that sort of thing. So, right, the fontanelles of the skull, what are they? Why are they there? Um, we, there, are, there are six of them, kind of four. Anyway, right, we'll do the anatomy of the fontanelles, all right? Fontanelles. So, uh, the neurocranium, the bones of the cranial cavity, are flat bones. They are curved, but they're, they're flat. They're not like long bones. And they're joined by fibrous joints called sutures. But mammals have these weird things. So at birth and during early childhood, uh, these soft but very tough membranes are linking the bones of the neurocranium. And these are called fontanelles. Um, this really takes me back actually. I remember palpating my kids' anterior fontanelle when they were little. It's, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, that's funny how things like that take you back, isn't it? Um, they had a bit of hair though. Um, the fontanelle, so the word fontanelle comes from the Latin word fons meaning fountain and whether that's because you can actually sometimes normally palpate the pulse uh, of the baby by putting your finger on the fontanelle or whether it's, I think more likely, it's like a, a dip in the top of the skull and a natural spring in a mountain is often like a little bit of a dip with water coming, I don't know, something like that, but fontanelle, font, fountain, that's where the word has come from. Why did I mention mammals? Well, the thing about mammals is they're breastfed, you know, they, they drink milk from the mother after birth, but they, they pass through the birth canal. Oh, I've got another model. Check this out, this is cool. <laughs> Look, see, birth canal, there's your... <laughs> the skull, so the baby has to pass through the birth canal, which in us bipedal mammals is even, even trickier because the pelvis has to be a certain shape so that we can stand up and walk, but it makes the birth canal a little bit narrower and a little bit trickier. So that, that leads to a couple of things like, um, you know, humans are born at a very young age and then go to live with their parents. That's an old gag. But they're born young, you know, babies, human babies need a lot of looking after. They can't just get up, get up and run around like other animals. Um, so there is a problem with passing the head through the birth canal. Uh, other bits of the body are kind of bendy. You can fold them, you can squish them a little bit, but this doesn't take, you, know, you can't really squish the skull. So the fontanelles, that's part of their job is that they allow some a little movement of the bones of the skull to help the head pass through the birth canal. But then after birth, they allow rapid growth of the cranial cavity and then also rapid growth of the brain during the early years. So in the first year of human life, um, the brain grows really, really rapidly. And it's important that the bones keep up with that and allow for it. So that's the purpose of the fontanelle to allow for rapid growth and to help pass the skull through the birth canal. There are two midline fontanelles and two lateral fontanelles on either side, making a total of one, two, three, four, five, six. And there are sometimes some little extra ones as well. Oh, this one's got a little extra one. The main fontanelle that we talk about is this anterior fontanelle, also called the bregmatic fontanelle. This is the classic soft spot. This is a tough membrane and what we've got here is we've got the frontal bones and the two parietal bones and at this stage look there are two frontal bones and they're split by a frontal suture which also gets called a metopic suture and um, the, the anterior fontanelle then is a diamond shape where the frontal suture meets the coronal suture 
and the sagittal suture. The frontal suture will disappear. This will become a single frontal bone. So the anterior fontanelle will become bone in the future. It's actually the last fontanelle to close. Um, and when this becomes bone, uh, where we see those sutures meeting, this point here gets called bregma. But right at this stage, this is the bregmatic fontanelle or the anterior fontanelle. Anterior fontanelle, I can neither go that away, or probably more sensibly, that away. Posteriorly, we see this triangular fontanelle. This is the um, posterior fontanelle or the occipital fontanelle. Look, it's a lot smaller. And this is the occipital bone meeting the two parietal bones here. Uh, this is the uh, sagittal suture meeting the lambdoid suture, this upside down kind of lambda shape, V shape. Um, and when this fontanelle closes and becomes bone, this part of the skull will be called the lambda, where we see these sutures meeting, but that's the posterior fontanelle. Those are the two main fontanelles that we talk about. Now laterally, look, we can see there are two lateral fontanelles. This fontanelle is called the mastoid fontanelle or the posterolateral fontanelle. So down here, we're gonna have the mastoid process. That's the lump of bone you can feel there. Um, posterior to the ear, the mastoid process. So here, this gets a bit more tricky, but we've got the parietal bone meeting the occipital bone, meeting the mastoid part of the temporal bone. Um, so we've got the uh, squamosal suture, the um, end of the lambdoid suture, we've got the occipitomastoid suture, we've got the parietomastoid suture, right? We've got all these sutures coming together here and we have this other soft spot this posterolateral fontanelle. When this becomes bone or a collection of sutures, this point will be the asterion, like an asterisk. This is gonna be the star, right? The, the, we have, as I just described, there's a lot of sutures there. Now, so see where we are here. If we run anteriorly, this is the anterolateral fontanelle or the sphenoid fontanelle, because in here, this is the sphenoid bone laterally, that very central bone in here, but we see the lateral bit of it. So we have the frontal bone, the sphenoid bone, the parietal bone, and the temporal bone, the squamous part of the temporal bone, they're all meeting here. So there's another soft spot. So there's the sphenoid um, fontanelle. So here we have the coronal suture meeting the squamosal suture, meeting the frontosphenoidal suture, meeting the sphenosquamosal suture, and um, <laughs> again, there's a lot of sutures here. This is a major meeting point of bones. And when this fontanelle closes over and we have sutures meeting here and bones joined by sutures and everything's bone and joint, this will become the pterion, this H shape of sutures that we see here laterally, this kind of uh, somewhat um, delicate part of the side of the head. The, the pterion is there. So these fontanelles, these membranous connections between bones allowed rapid, allowing lap, rap, the, uh, they allow rapid growth of the bones of the cranial cavity. So when do they close? Well, the posterior fontanelle usually closes first, about two to three months after birth. The sphenoidal fontanelle usually closes at about six months after birth. The mastoid fontanelle, will have closed between six to 18 months after birth. That's a pretty wide gap there, right? So then it's the anterior fontanelle that is the last to close, which is often closed by 18 months after birth. Sometimes doesn't close until 30 months after birth. This is biology. Biology is hugely variable. So the clo that's, the, that's the closure order, but the timings are gonna vary. And it's very important that um, these fontanelles don't close until good growth has occurred. Because if, if one of these uh, fontanelles was to close early, was to ossify early and become bone, it will affect the shape of the skull as it grows and could affect the growth of the brain inside the skull. 
So clinically then, the anterior, I mean, these fontanelles are useful um, for if you want to look inside the skull because you can use ultrasound through these soft spots, you can't really use it through the bone. Um, but really, it's this, this soft spot, the anterior fontanelle, that's probably most interesting. It can be quite normally a little bit depressed and it can be quite normally a little bit elevated. I remember when kids are really you know, really crying, really unhappy, really giving it some, it does tend to bulge up a little bit. So that's normal, but it can also be used as an, in, as an indicator of uh, raised intracranial pressure and that sort of thing. So it, you know, it's, a, it's something to be, to be considered. Um, I, I remember as a parent that it does feel like a very soft, very delicate part of the baby. And you know, babies, they do need a lot of care. You do need to be careful with them, but it is actually anatomically a very tough membrane. <clears throat> um, oh yeah, accessory, look, so so there's the, the face, so there's the anterior fontanelle, here's the sagittal suture, there's the posterior fontanelle, look, there's a little extra one there. And that's, that's, that's pretty common, I think it's probably more common than we realise, um, but there are often extra fontanelles in these sutures as well, or these developing sutures, cool, huh? It's nice the model shows that, it's a really, really nice model. Anyway, there we go. Um, so the fontanelles of the human uh, skull of the neurocranium, which you'll find in the fetus around the time of birth and for many months after birth. All right, see, I told you there's always some <laughs> more skull anatomy to find. Maybe we really will move on to something not skull next week, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't put a bet on it. <clears throat> see you next week. Mm -hmm.